Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Canola, and welcome back to another edition of the movie Battleground. Hope everybody is doing well here tonight. Uh, in this matchup, we have two players that are returning, uh, both looking certainly for a win to sort of upturn their luck. Uh, on one side, we have Ryan Payne, who is, of course, a longstanding player in the league in general, uh, but is still relatively newer to this new iteration of Battleground at a record of one and two and still looking, in a sense, to sort of find that footing and consistency. Against him, we have someone who is a little bit newer in Ross Bristow, who made his debut earlier this season uh, in a, in a well-fought but close loss to uh, Jeremy Potters, and so of course he'll be looking to pick up that first win that is always important for the players, uh, just in terms of, you know, feeling and confidence and, and all that uh, connected to it. So with that said, we'll go ahead and jump into some brief discussions, introducing first, with a record of no wins, one defeat, we are joined by Ross Bristow. Ross, welcome, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing good, you know, just had a good day, so yeah, I'm excited about this, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So obviously uh, your, your first match, uh, it was a good performance, despite the fact that it wasn't a win, obviously yourself and Jeremy, both being rookies, uh, people were definitely very complimentary of your performance in that and had a lot of faith of you going into a match. Obviously the way that the scheduling worked out, you're not playing a total, total rookie. You're getting a little bit of a step up and playing someone with slightly more experience. So how does that affect you coming into this? Um, I just have to be in you know, like rare, rare their focus. And then like, you know, like hopefully I'll do a little bit better. I mean, you know, like hopefully I'll win, but I just here for fun, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and sit you in the back and introduce your opponent coming in with a record of one win, two defeats. He is known as the Caramel Mountain, I think. I don't know. Maybe he's changed his nickname. He is Ryan Payne looking. Man, can I just say the hair looks excellent, dude. That is. Are you growing it out or is that just like how it is? <laughs> well, I have been growing it out, but I think it stopped a certain length from now on. So I'm just like maintaining its form every now and then after I take this, take a head wrap off. It just, I get that look like, um, like one of the, like those classic cartoon characters. <laughs> Oh. I was going to say, I, I feel like the last, like, three times I've had you on here as a judge or as a player, you've had the rag on, so I haven't seen it in a bit. No, very, very good. <laughs> Aside from your side endeavors, we're here to talk about debate, of course. Uh, you have a lot of experience at this. I mean, you've done it plenty of times. But in the newer league with the resets and everything involved there, you're still newer to an extent. You're still only at one and two with your record. How do you feel about tonight's matchup? Well, I mean... I feel very, I feel very good. I mean, to be honest, um, can't say it's been a while that I've almost forgotten a little bit of my my little arguments and counter arguments I wanted to make. But you know, but, but despite that, and despite Ross, he's still new. I'm still going to approach this very like with a game plan. You know, I'm going to try to stay on point with my arguments so I don't try to you know prone off during when, whenever when Ross and I start going back and forth. And I want to make sure I stay consistent. So when it comes with judging, I'm able to get my points across instead of just trying to make a point and then think it's going to follow me all the way to closing. You know, anything can happen between like eight minutes of arguing. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and of course, as with the last just small handful of matches that have gone up, this is being recorded shortly after we had to take a uh, unforced uh, production break or sorry, a forced production break is probably more correct. Uh, on my end. And in addition to that, uh, we also had to reschedule before that because Ryan had to serve jury duty. How was that? Did you have fun? Well, I sat around for a long time. And then all of a sudden when the jurors realized, I mean, when the people there realized that I didn't have a solid schedule to stay, if I was able to call back, they're just like, oh, we're just going to reschedule you again within the year. So <laughs> it wasn't going to be like a one and done for me, unfortunately. I might get, I, I'm going to be called back sometime later this year. <laughs> well, at least you have something to look forward to. Uh, but in terms of things to look forward to now, I'm going to go ahead and bring Ross in, and we'll go ahead and get into this. Movie Battleground is a game that is a best of five rounds. It is the first to three points, takes the match. Each round of debate is worth 
one point. If a competitor picks up the first three points in a row, that will be a victory by knockout. And if at the end of four rounds, we have a two to two tie, we do have a blind round question ready to go, but we'll worry about that should we need it. Uh, aside from that, the competitors have had the questions. They have had the time that they can allot to it to prep. Uh, they will have an opening 60 seconds followed by an expanding two minutes. Then they will have a four minute open back and forth discussion followed by a 60 second closing. Following that, I have two judges backstage in the form of Chris and Don. They will join us on screen and make their deliberation. In the event that they reach a different conclusion, I will also be taking notes during the debate and I will make the tie breaking vote should it be necessary. With all that said, though, guys, do we have any questions or are we ready to go? I'm no good. Questions. No, good to go. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into this, uh, and uh, we'll move into a new type of question. Uh, one of the things that I've done this year with the show as we move into 2023, I say move into, we're like halfway through the year by the time this goes up, uh, but one of the things that I've done in 2023 is I've sort of, I have tried to sort of expand, think of new types of questions, think of new angles to approach a question from, and this is certainly one of those, and we are going to take it back to one of, I would argue, the premier years in cinema history, and that is 1994, a year in which we had five Best Picture nominees, three of which people vehemently argue as some of the greatest films of all time, and another two that certainly bound up as one of the best years of all time. Uh, and obviously, uh, we do know that Forrest Gump one best picture and i only say this because neither of the competitors picked forrest gump for their answer i think a lot of people looking back and looking back on that would change that i don't know if as many people would keep forrest gump as the best picture winner so the question is of the five nominees from the year 1994 what was the best best picture nominee uh, now, of course, unfortunately, this is one of the, as I said, this is one of the couple matches we're recording. Uh, I don't have any of the normal graphics ready, so I hope that question makes sense to the people at home. We're asking, of the five Best Picture nominees from said year, which one was the best film? Uh, and again, I think these guys have two. Let's see, we're talking Best Picture nominees. The percentage points on how many of them are not good movies is pretty low. So we have some good picks here, and I'm excited to see these two go at it. Uh, especially because I feel like rarely these two are the ones that are pitted one-on-one -on -one against each other, which will make it fun. Uh, with that said, though, behind the scenes, Ryan, you are the higher-ranked competitor, so you had the choice of which questions to go first on. You chose to go first on two and four, which mm -hmm. means Ross, you're going to be up first on this question. I'm going to go ahead and pull in your timer for you, and it will start, uh, Ross, when you begin speaking. Best of luck, guys. Yeah. Okay, my pick is um is like the Shawshank Redemption. It is like probably like the most like beloved film, film one of the best, most like beloved films ever. You know, you know, like that started out as a flop, but then it but then it's become classic, and then like it is a number one rated film on IMDb, and it has everything like acting, directing, writing. It has it is, it is almost the perfect movie. And then like whenever I talk to people, whenever it's on TV. It doesn't matter how far they are in, in they just watch it all the way through. So yeah, I yield my time. Okay, all right. Let me go ahead and bump the clock forward there for Ryan. Uh, well, okay, not a little too far, but you'll get those three seconds back. I promise. <laughs> the timer starts when you begin speaking. My pick for the best best picture movie winner was actually is actually Quiz Show. Mainly for the reason is that around that time when films were being you know around the nineties when films were garnered and praised, the film that won best picture really got a lot of recognition and notoriety among film goers and like film critics and film snobs, and that and that notoriety would carry itself throughout the generation and decades later on. I picked Quiz Show because that is a film actually watching it that is a film that really deserved its re that notoriety and recognition because it did a lot it even though it's a simple straight drama and a bit of a thriller at times that film does have a few does great acting it has a great cast surrounding it and the direction who then the director by robert and the movie directed by robert ford really does a good job of really getting ourselves into the film in general i mean i'll go more into it later on so i'm gonna see my time all right. Uh, of course, I won't be fact-checking uh, today only because I uh, 
I'm, I'm trying to judge, and I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I'm sitting on my phone half the debate. Uh, but I do want to throw out there, because I don't know if it was just the internet, but it was Robert Redford directed the film, because part of it at least cut out on my end. I did say that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he did. I heard him. Okay, cool. Didn't know if it was just me. I heard, like, directed, and then it just cut. I was like, all right, cool. Uh, so, Ross, we'll go back over to you, sir. Two minutes on the clock for you. Okay. Okay, like you, you said about you know you know like like how good it is. Like it is a great movie. I do love it, but it doesn't have the public consciousness that that like Shawshank does. And then like like it like like and then like yeah yes you say it's a simple story. Shawshank is too, but but like Shawshank is this epic. You know you know you know like with a great story. Your story is a simple one, one one that is very good. But uh, now, like you know, like, like if you were to ask like five people in the street, was quiz show? Maybe two might know. But if you were to ask five people in the street, what it, what is, um, what is, what is Shawshank? I, I guarantee four, maybe even five would know. Yeah. So yeah, I yield my time. Okay. All right. Can't nail it. All right, Ryan. Time starts for you. Two minutes on the clock. When ready? Now I'm going to reiterate back to what I said in my opening during that time of the '90s, and even now with the Oscars. When people think of films and they think of the Oscars, when you go to Best Picture, everyone goes to what film they be- not just they believe, but when they watch, they do believe that when they associate with Best Picture, it is something that is deserved of. Especially given now with the most late in the 2000s, even saying 2010s, with most films that have been nominated in one Best Picture, everyone's been arguing which one deserves the most, which one deserves it better. To me, Quiz Show deserves it better, not because of the direction it was, but because Quiz Show, like most films, I'm not going to say it panders to Hollywood's playing off of a true life event or based in an, or adapting off of a true life story, but it's one of those films that Hollywood actually uh, grasps towards, and this film, most and the film itself, Quiz Show, it is something that reflected the culture of the time, which is about uh, a, a, a game a game show that was very popular that got called out because they were giving contestants because the producers were giving answers to the to the contestants, and guess what? That happened in real life. So knowing that this film itself plays off of our own history, our more recent history around with the t- with the dawn of television is a lot to show that this film deserved the recognition, well, maybe not deserve, but needs the recognition amongst casual fans. Now, the other film, Shawshank Redemption, yes, it's a great movie. And sure, it's, I would say itself is also a simple story. But the thing is, is that it doesn't need the nomination because seeing how later on in our generation, people go back and they watch that film and they recognize it. And that film did not get reserved. That film did not get the notoriety until it was constantly played over and over and over on cable television. Quiz show is something that could have deserved that as well. So having now playing played on show networks like TCM and AMC, I'm going to stop here before I start proning on. I'll, I'll, I'll continue later. All right. That'll be time. We're going to have the four-minute open discussion here. Uh, as always, I like to remind the, remind the competitors, don't try and stomp over each other too much. Find a back and forth. Give each other the chance to get some points in there. But you'll all find a rhythm for it. That said, the timer starts when the first competitor speaks. Yeah, but, like, when you said that, you know, like, it doesn't need the nomination, I believe it do- does. Is because, like, you know, like, y- yeah, yes, it do- does. Is because, like, some of the best films ever made are best are best picture nominees. So you cannot just like throw in the whole thing about you know you know like it doesn't it doesn't need the nomination, not nomination. Like it's because you know like it is considered one of the greatest films ever made. And then and then like you know you know you know not now like I think they pulled anonymously like like twenty Academy members and they said that they would have vote, voted for Shawshank had they given the chance. So yeah. yeah. It, Ross, you're all right. That is some good points we make, like in hindsight. But looking at that, with Shawshank Redemption, I did mention earlier that film did not start getting more or notoriety amongst general audiences if it wasn't constantly played on television. Quiz Show, while 
yes, if you played it on like cable TV, many people would skip over. But if you had it played today on networks like AMC, TC, Turner Classic Movies, and e maybe even some of the more premium networks like HBO, you'd see it would be drawing more eyes to it. And you and also talking about the historical reference that that movie makes. Yeah our own time of being obsessed with game shows yeah but though to be fair though too like you you said today nobody watches amc really today and then like nobody watches like hbo if you think about it you know like people use amc plus so they're not going to turn on their tv and watch quiz show you know like nobody really watches live tv anymore so yeah so but 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 not like my film though yes it took took time but the whole thing about the academy too you know you know like the Academy loved the loved the historical historical dramas, like and then like I believe like our films are set during the same time period. Yeah, but my mine like could actually happen, but it, but it's fiction. They actually had to come up with it on their own. And then the Academy likes likes like not many like original stories. So yeah. True, original stories is what is what makes great films. But looking at the Academy's history, they've always recognized films that always play off of real life. Now, I can't bring up a lot of examples, but if you just look back at the, between the 2000s and the 2010s, biograph, I mean, bi, bi, biopics have almost been nominated always at, in either directing field, the original screenplay field, the acting guild, and even in the acting category, and for the best picture category. So to say the Academy only just likes original stories is a fair point to make, but you can't also, but you cannot just ignore the fact that they love movies that base off of real life, especially films that like to satirize or at least play or do homages to Hollywood itself. And Quiz Show, I do believe, veers into that category to where it kind of falls into the production of television, which falls into Hollywood. And but I but I don't want to rest on the laurels alone. It also does great acting in that film. Ray Fiennes and John Turturro give great performances in this film. And Robert Robert Redford, as a director who is also an actor, does a great job in getting these performances out of both of them, along with the stellar cast that's on there. You want to talk about stellar cast? You have Clancy Brown, Morgan Freeman, Tim Robbins, Bob Gunton. Uh, you know, like you know, like all of them give you know, like Oscar worthy performances too. So like, and then like Frank Darabont, who actually who actually is not an actor, I think actually like delivered the better, gave the better, actually like directed them to two better performances. So so yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Like so did Robert Redford, but though, but you gotta think though, Robert Robert Redford is an actor. You know, um, but he's yeah. also at three times. He's also directed three films before Quiz Show. One of the one of the most film is Ordinary People, which he also got an Oscar director nomination. And yeah, though, though to think so about he it, has the so he has the experience to do, to do something like that for Quiz Show. Yeah, but though, but if you think about it too, really, this was this, this was Frank Darabont's first movie too. So to give those kind of performances. All right, uh, so we're gonna go into the closing minute here. Uh, Ross, you are back up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Like, you know, like about the first film thing, you know, like to get those kind of performances out of those actors for a first film is incredible. And then, and then, and then like, you know, like also too, like, I believe that like he wrote this, he, he adapted the screenplay, like your film has an experience, has, has the experience. So like, you know, like, and then the Academy was not, was like nominating, you know, you know, you know, you know, like fresh new faces. And then, and then like, you know, like the Shawshank Redemption, you know, like it's considered like one, one of the best movies in the history of cinema. Quiz Show is seen as a very good movie. And then the Academy is always about, you know, like, like voting for the best. So yeah, you have my time. All right, so we're going to go over uh, to the final minute of the round for Ryan. Uh, the timer starts for you once it turns over to zero. I do agree with my uh, part, my opponent, Ross, that the Academy, they do nominate, they do pick films that are the best, and I want to hold to that sentiment. But if anything of the Academy's history has proven that it's a very subjective 
position on what they think is the best. Now, that's not to discredit his pick for the Sawshank Redemption, but as I mentioned before in my opening statement with Quiz Show and throughout the entire thing, it is a film that does that needs the notoriety because it just like with films nowadays with Hollywood, it it draws on historical real life context. It has great acting performances, and to draw on what Ross said about a first time director, Robert Director's first film was Ordinary People, and he won a directing Academy Award, and he directed great performances in that film as well. And so, not to say Frank Darabont couldn't do the same thing. But he's all. But Repper has already has the backup and the experience to do that again. And Quiz Show is out of all the five nominees in that category is one that is being underlooked throughout the generations moving forward. And if it had that Best Picture win, it would solidify itself for people to look back at it. And time. All right, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put you guys in the back and bring the judges forward. Uh, with that said, Chris, I'm going to go to you first. Who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? I think I'm going to mine. I think he did more than just talk about the cat, talk about the subject matter. I mean, how you know, if it won, it'd be more than writing, and I just felt like my book hits all over. It felt like by people at the cat, you know, directed, you know, he didn't really talk about much about the movie. It's not why I talk a little bit more. Yeah. All right, uh, Don, down to you. Yeah, I gotta agree with Chris. He he just he sold me more on the movie. I mean, they both had really good arguments for why they could be picked, but I feel like I just got more out of Ryan. So I went I went with Ryan also. All right. So Ryan will get the first point there, judges. Thank you guys. I'm gonna go ahead and put you in the back and we will go ahead and move on to question number two here. Uh and question number two. Uh, uh, I guess we're also going to be staying yeah. slightly older here because uh, both of these directors had their hay sort of in previous years and previous decades. Uh, so I'm curious to see where this is more or where this one goes. The question is, which director who's never made a spoof film would be a good fit to make one? Uh, and again, sort of clarify the concept of the question. It's basically we're taking a director who has uh, never made – us a spoof film or a very publicly acknowledged spoof film in that sense, who would be the best choice to make one? Uh, so with that said, Ryan, you are up first this time around. So I'll go ahead and give it to you. And when you are ready, you can begin. My choice for the director that should have made a spoof film in their career is Mike Nichols. Now, before I continue, I will stress out that Mike Nichols did pass away nine years ago, around 2014. But Beyond, but before his death, though, uh, even in his in his career in his filmography, he always he has a very collection of comedy films. Sometimes drama dr drama comedies, uh, romantic comedies, historical comedies in his in, in his arsenal. So to me, it felt like somewhere along his heyday, he could have made a great spoof film. Some, some maybe around the time of the decades of the eighties, the nineties, or the two thousand before. His, before of his, uh, I won't say on time, but before his passing. And also, he always has great actors to work with every now and then. And, well, not great actors, but he always like great co-pairings with actors. Okay, I'm losing my point here. I'm just going to say Mike Nichols, and I'm going to cede my time. <laughs> All right, no problem. <laughs> uh, Mike Nichols is the open there. Uh, Ross, I'm going to go over to you. You have two minutes, on, or one minute to open when ready. And you're muted. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay. My 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 pick is Steven Spielberg. It's because you know, like Steven Spielberg has done a little bit of parody in films, but now like you know, you know, like comedy is the only genre he's not succeeded in. And I'm like, I'd like to see him give it another try. It's because you know, you know, you know, now not now like all most of his films actually do have funny elements in them. You know, you know, like like all the Indiana Joneses, and then like hook and then like uh, other other ones you know you don't know like like I, I would love to see him spoof you know like another genre genre you know you know what why what like a world war ii drama or something you know like make it funny and i know he tried it with with 1941 but but if you really pay attention to his films his films do have like comedic elements but no spoof spoofs you know you know you know like and then like you know um 
why, why he could like even like spoof his own films, where which I think would be amazing if he did that. So yeah, I yield my time. All right, and then uh, as always, I like to throw out disclaimers where I feel they're applicable. Uh, obviously, as Ryan mentioned, Mike Nichols is no longer with us. He's no longer actively directing, uh, but the question did not pertain to somebody today actively making a film. Uh, it's just in general, which director's filmography should they have made a spoof film? So uh, it was accepted, of course. Uh, and then obviously both directors have made films uh, that could be defined as comedies or have heavy, heavy comedic elements. Of course, Spielberg does have 1941. Uh, uh, arguably, Mike Nichols' most famous film in The Graduate is a comedy to a great extent. Uh, uh, but uh, neither have made spoof specifically designated, hence also eligible for the question. Uh, always just like to clarify to give the competitors that chance there. So with that said, Ryan, you're back up. Two minutes on the clock when ready. Can you hear me before we start? Before we start? Uh, yes. Okay. It, my screen had that little uh, buffering mo for a moment, so I just want to make sure I'm clear. Yep, you are good. Okay. To continue what I was going to say on my point about Mike Nichols is, uh, yes, he has a huge collection of mixture of comedies that's part of a genre. Like I mentioned, rom-com, dramedy commas. I mean, uh, before, uh, earlier on I mentioned, The Graduate, his most notable one, but his also his second most notable comedy is The Birdcage. And that film alone, I wouldn't say the film alone justifies that he should, that he could have done a spoof. But the comedy work that he was able to get out of performances from Robin Williams, Gene Hackman, Nathan Lane, Carlista Flockhart, Hank Azaria shows to me that he could have done a spoof film that could have been like a very straightforward performance like the like with Airplane, you know, a, a, a common scenario where you could have had a, a common setting of a plot going forward. And he brings in actors who are very straightforward in their dialogue, but it's always the comedy of the situation that could play into the spoof of it. I mean, the actors, and I can immediately see the actors he could work with for a spoof. I mean, he can reunite with Robin Williams and Nathan Lane. He can bring in Jack Nicholson, who he's collaborated with a lot. Same with Meryl Streep. He could have, even Hank Azaria along. That itself sets to a very good cast to do a spoof film. And even and moving on forward, uh, his, I forget the name of the writer that he collaborated with for The Birdcage, but he could reunite with her to create the script for a spoof as well. Because one thing Mike Nichols does in his films, no matter what kind they are, they're always a lot about, there's always a lot of heart in there. It's always about the human element in his films. And while the spoof film could be a straight comedy, I think this film could, the spoof film could also be something that can speak to the human element that would make it very, con to connect with his audiences. And I will stop there. All right, that will be Ryan's two minutes. We're going to come up uh, over to you, Ross, two minutes on the clock when you are ready. Yeah, okay. Okay, if you want to talk about heart, you know, Steven Spielberg's films are actually like all heart, and they all have a little bit of comedic elements. He never really directed. He did one comedy, and then he stopped, and I, he should really try, try it again, you know, you know, you know, like, because, you know, like, 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 you know, like, you could argue – are, are, are argue that like some of the Indiana Jones are spoof films, but they don't know they are. But you know, like two, two, now, like you know, you know, like like Steve Spielberg also could work with you know, like imagine a, imagine a Steven Spielberg spoof spoof with with Tom Cruise and Tom Hanks again. So yeah, you know, you know, now, like um, you know, like I would love to see Spielberg do a spoof is because you know, you know, like he's conquered every genre except for one. So yeah, I yield my time. All right, I'll go ahead and jump forward into the four-minute discussion then. Uh, with that said, the timer starts back up when the first competitor speaks. Uh, without a doubt, um, both of our directors are very good choices to do spoof films. I just think with Spielberg, at least in his filmography... It didn't look like he ever had time or if there was ever room for him to actually want to shoot a spoof. As you did mention, he did one comedy and he just stopped from there. It seems to me that Spielberg likes to do a film that has multiple genres in there instead of doing one that's straight through. 
Now, there could be a counter argument to Mike Nichols to where he's done a mixture that's of two genres, but still looking at the films with graduates and with uh, The Birdcage, those are straight through comedies, despite many people that could argue that they could be a mixture of two separate ones. I actually think that the, that the graduate is actually like it's a, it has funny moments, but it's actually a drama. It's like it's about this guy who now like who basically now like you know, like doesn't know what to want to do with his life, you know. So yeah, but and then and then like about about like not the time we're not wanting to. I think it's more uh, of a you know like um of like you know you know like all of his films you know like have comedic elements. So then if like he would have focused on that instead of like trying to go like over the top top you know like you know like if he played it straight like you said by like with airplane that could be great and then and like i i think i i think after that you know like it would be in spielberg wheelhouse to do one to do you know to do a con to do a, a spoof like that yeah but as and that is true spielberg was willing to do that i just honestly i just don't see personally of him of him wanting to do a spoof film because currently right now I, I can't say I don't know of his current whereabouts. Okay, that's what, that's a bad spark. But I, it just doesn't seem to me that it's something that Spielberg wants to veer towards. I mean, you do get maybe if the right script comes along or if the right project is. Well, I could say the same thing about Mike Nichols, but but okay, I'm veering off here. What I'm trying to say is that Spielberg honestly doesn't seem to me as someone who has the general interest of wanting to do a spoof film. Brother, with Mike Nichols, as I've mentioned before, as I, in my solo pitch, if he was going to do a spoof film, he does have already a writer that he can read, the same writer that he did the bird, that he collaborated with the Birdcage to do a spoof, to write a to write a script. He can he has plenty of actors that he's already worked with in the past to collaborate with. Heck, maybe even do a re, reunite him and Dustin Hoffman. Maybe do a spoof of The Graduate, you know, because there's already been many remakes of that film. Yeah, but like to be fair, though, you know, like you know, like we don't know what what my my Nichols wanted to do either. So like you know, like yeah, yeah so like you know, what ifs you don't know because it'd be like Mike Nichols toward the end, like you know, like he did do a lot of comedies, you know, towards the end, but they were like you know, like but they were always like you said a mixture of, of genres, like and so is Spielberg. But I could see Spielberg actually like literally, you know, you know, you know, like wanting wanting to like dip his toe in the in the comedy thing again is because you know like he i can see him want, wanting that redemption you know that he that he never got yeah but uh but but i do want to do state out with mike Nichols that he has more of a experience over spielberg you did say spielberg has comedic elements in his film well mike well Nichols, he has films that has a lot of comedy in them, not just within just certain moments. Uh, for example, the the B Biloxi Blues that he adapted from a playwright, or Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. While there's some intense dramatic moments there, he knows how to balance both of those out with comedy in order to really undercut a situation, and not just for comedic lines, but he plays on the on the surroundings. He does he does comedy through the surroundings, the situation, and happenstance, which all which makes the the lines and the performances from the actors even better. So does Steven Spielberg re re remember like the scene in a scene in Ray's Lost Ark when when he shoots the guy? You know he just doesn't do comedic lines either. You know like and then like he actually like bring, brings out the comedic performances in the actors. So yeah. And that's time. All right, we're gonna go on to the f one minute closing. Ryan, you're back up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. Now, throughout the entire uh, debate, me, myself, and Ross were definitely going back and forth on pretty much a lot of what is, which is pretty much this whole debate is nothing but a what if. But I do believe deep down that Mike Nichols really had more of the opportun opportunity, if you look in his filmography, to do a spoof film. As I did say before, he could have done a spoof on The Graduate, which there was a remake earlier on, a remake in between after his that had Matthew Broderick in it, which in, in a way was more comedic than the one he did. That could have been a very funny telling that he does another graduate that most likely brings in Dustin Hoffman and Matthew Broderick to maybe do like a little tongue-in-cheek little poking fun at both of their works in the movie The Graduate. And also... um. Mike Nichols, he is. Um... Oh God, I lost my I lost my train of thought. But I'm only running out of time, so I'll end it there. <laughs> All right, which means Ross will go back over to you for the final minute of the round. Your timer starts when you begin speaking. 
okay. You say that you know you know you know like all the films are comedic, but and like Steven Spielberg, you know, like films aren't. I mean, like what's what what's so interesting, you know, about a comedic director directing a comedy? You know, like and then like Spielberg mostly does these dramas and then these action films with like comedic elements. Imagine a Spielberg, you know, spoof with like Tom Hanks and Tom Cruise and like Leonardo DiCaprio. So yeah, so that's why you know, like I think that like Spielberg would be better is because like you know, like he hasn't really done a comedy versus you know like Mike Nichols has done tons of comedies. So yeah, I yield my time. All right. So we'll go ahead and put the competitors in the back and we will bring the judges forward. Uh this time, Don, we're gonna go to you first, sir. Who All gets right. your yeah, this went a little back and forth for me, but I think at the end, I think who made the most counterpoints, because like Ryan said, it was a lot of what ifs. So I think for me, it was Ross. I think Ross had the most counterpoints for me to uh, uh, for Steven Spielberg over Mike Nichols. Sorry. OK, uh, Chris, down to you. Yeah, funny. It was also back and forth for me. And then Watts finally said something at the end that got me to the point where, like, that I couldn't nickel already done comedy, but I, you know, had done mostly drama with community earlier. That element of him doing comedy this time and then the community timing, that argument won it for me at the last minute. Bye. All I can think of now is Spielberg doing an ET. All right. So <laughs> that's just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so they scored one to one. Thank you, guys. I'm going to go ahead and bring the competitors back in, and we will go ahead and jump into number three of this match. Uh, and it, it's funny that Tom Hanks was used as a selling point uh, for Ross in two when it comes to Spielberg, because while Tom Hanks is an incredible actor with many, many incredible projects, uh, he's also been in some shit. Doesn't happen very often, but it has happened. He's been in some horrible, horrible films. And so as submitted to us, uh, it is this a viewer submitted question sent in by Zachary Shelton. The question is simply, what is Tom Hanks' worst film? Uh, and we have, we got some shit here. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, with that said, Ross, we're back up first this time around. So the timer will start for you when you begin speaking. Okay. I am going to pick last year's Pinocchio. That movie is just awful. It's a Disney live action remake without the edge of the original. And then like, you know, like they have jokes that I'll tell later that are just like awful, not even funny good, you know. Like any movie that's I'm going to give an example, just one what okay. Any movie that's set in the in the like old Italy literally have a line you could be an influencer yeah so yeah i'm gonna yield my time all right i'll go ahead and jump the timer forward there uh ryan you have one minute on the clock to open the timer starts when you begin speaking i think the worst film oh. in tom hanks filmography Sorry, I thought you were What's muted. Up? Sorry, you're lagging. That's why. Sorry. Oh, I'm okay. lagging. A little bit. You're good. I can I can hear you fine on my end, Ryan. Okay. Okay. All right. Here we go. Looking at Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks filmography, the only film that really looks to me that is the worst is The Lady Killers. That film directed by both the Coen brothers. You think with the Coen brothers having their name attached to it, it would be a very good it would be a good film given their track record, especially this film is just earlier on before they have their uh Oscar break Oscar winning film No Country for Old Men or as I for Oscar nominated film No Country for Old Men. You think that this with this film would be a great film and also with Tom Hanks involved, this would be it, it felt like a no 
like a you know like a no brainer. The Coens, Tom Hanks. I mean, they do good stuff, but no, this film is honestly kind of bad, and it's a bad, and it's also a remake of another film with the, of the Lady Killers. Which, if you watch this film and then you watch the or the one earlier on in the '60s, pretty much people are going to prefer that one in the '60s because it was kind of played straightforward. This one. It's really trying to ham up on a lot of comedic, bu- like Bumble comedic stuff that the Coens did with Dumb and Dumber. It just doesn't pull off with this one. And time. All right. We're going to go back over to you, Ross. You have two minutes on the clock when ready. Okay. Okay. A good, a bad Coen Brothers movie is still going to be entertaining. My movie is just boring and then, like, not entertaining at all. And then, like, you think that those jokes are bad. There's literally, after the influence line, they actually literally say, I know what your name could be. Chris Pine. Yeah. So, like, your film is, like, I got some chuckles out of your film when I saw it in the theater back in the day. But this film, you know, you know, like, I know it's made for kids. But, the, but, but, but like, you know, like, imagine if you had a movie that was almost perfect. And then you redid it and you attached Tom Hanks to it, you know, like, and then you took out all the, all the edgy stuff. So yeah, I yield my time. All right. I'm going to shift back over to you, Ryan, as I'll jump forward. Uh, You will have two minutes on the clock. Time starts when you begin speaking. The difference between a Coen's brother film and then mostly all these live action Disney animated films is that there was actually a bar for the Coen brothers film when the Lady Killers came out. With the live action Pinocchio remake that came out, there was no bar at that point. Live, live, every live, almost every live action Disney film that has come out recently, despite how much they make at the box office, have not been critically received, and they have been pretty much panned by many of the general audiences, despite whatever score you see on there. The Pinocchio one could have been some, and even then, some of the lines that came out from it, yes, guess what? They wrote something that was for kids to pander to kids, to pander to young generations. This Lady Killers film, it felt like the Coen Brothers were just scraping at the bottom of the barrel. They were trying to recapture some of the magic that they had done earlier on in their careers with, I I confused, I mean, both of them didn't do a Dumb and Dumber film. I'm, that's that, that was the Fairly Brothers, which I recorrect myself on. But even then, comedy films they've done with Fargo, with The Big Lebowski. Like the, even, I would say their worst film, The Hutsucker Proxy, felt like as if there could be some comedy involved there. But this one just has nothing to offer, honestly. I mean, sure, Tom Hanks doing a Southern accent is funny. But even then, with the cast that he has there, which is kind of a shame because he's got a J.K. Simmons there, who's, very, who's a chameleon as a supporting character... Marlon Wayans, who you don't even know why he's there in the first place. This is around where he's just trying to be in almost everything. But set the premise itself, it kind of, you forget about the premise and the plot of them trying to rob a casino boat, and it's all about them going up against an old woman who's a god who's a you know who's god fearing, and it's just like how can we get past her over and then robbing this little casino there? You kind of forget this is supposed to be a crime caper. With Pinocchio, it's right there, plain and simple. A dog puppet comes to life, and guess what? He gets in some hijinks. Tom Hanks is trying to do an Italian accent, which you can tell he's almost failing at. At least it's kind of that bad enjoyment I get from it. This one is just kind of a, it's a movie. And time. All right, we're going to go into the four-minute open discussion. The timer starts back up when the first competitor speaks. Okay. Like, you say that, like, your film is not well-received. I looked at the Rotten Tomatoes scores. Your film is a godsend compared to mine in terms of the Rotten Tomato scores. It's because, like, the Lady Killers have a, um, let's see, ha- have a, like, a 50-something, okay, 54% critic score and a 43% audience score, which is not good, but it's not awful. Mine has a 29% critic score and a 28 audience score. And then, like, I know that mine is made for kids, but the but the original, you know, now like you know, you know, you know, now like has a ha, has a little bit of an edge to you know, like with the smoking cigars and the drinking the beers, they give them root beer, and then and then and then like you know, you know, like your film, yes, you know, like you know, like my, my film is a Robert Zemeckis film, a legend in the industry, just like the Coen Brothers. But though, but but you know, now you the know, fact that it's also a Zemeckis film, kind of. 
is also something that's hurting it, hurting it as well, in my opinion, because I, I won't say Zemeckis is terrible, but his constant need of using CGI has been a detriment to his films, especially in later ones when you look at the, uh, the with the Polar Express, something he's rec- he's done with Tom Hanks, uh, the Christmas Carol film. His constant overuse of CGI kind of hampers the film. While surprisingly, it's not the biggest takeaway from it, it's still it's still just not something that I kind of want to watch. With the, the, the Lady Killers, this is also a remake itself. And sure, this one, it's it, the, the previous one in the 50s was also a comedy, but it was able to find itself in a balance there, trying to remind people, on yes, it's a comedy, but there's also a little bit of a crime caper going on here. This one, with the Coen Brothers, decides to shove the little crime caper like in a little pocket and forget, and like, only presented towards later in the third act once you go through some of the insaneness that we see throughout the first two acts. Them being the old lady, not getting along with her. One of the crewmates gets a finger blown off. And then, of course, Tom Hanks doing the whole waffles. We must have waffles line. That's the one thing I can say anyone who thinks of that film can remember from it. With Pinocchio, at least those terrible influencer lines is something you can go, well, Disney just trying to pander to people again. That's one thing you can take away to where I can say it's a bad enjoyment of that Pinocchio. I remember though. I, I remember though now like like when Lady was Killed was coming out, there was actually like Oscar talk for one person in it. And I'm not joking either what was like Irma P. Hall. Oh, she, was, she's was, a fantastic actress. No yeah, doubt. yeah, but but and then like I don't remember any any you know, like Oscar talk for Pinocchio, you know, you, you know, like every, everyone laughed at, at Tom Hanks' accent. And then, and then, like you know, why, why, you know, you know, you know, why can not, not, no, like you know, um, he, he was just awful in it, and then, and then, like you know, like yes, I know that they're pandering to the kids, but still, still, you like, like kids should not be pandered, pandered to like that. So yeah, which, you know. which brings back to my point of the live action Disney remakes that we have seen lately. From the Cinderella to Beauty and the Beast to Aladdin to The Lion King and to so many Mulan. They have been nothing but pandering to an audience. And now with the most recent Little Mermaid, they're pandering. Despite the fact that there's films that you've mentioned before. Guess what? All these new remakes are going to do is make me love the previous ones. i never seen the 50s Ladies Killer until I had to watch this one. And even then, I won't be jarring to go back to watch that one after watching this one with the Coens. It just makes me realize the Coens just did this maybe just to... Get up, maybe just a bot, just for time in between intolerable cruelty and while they were shooting No Country for Old Men. Because once you look at, because honestly, you go down that list of the filmography, people are going to be shocked. They did this terrible movie before they did that one? With a bad adult film, there's something else with a bad children's film. It's because, like, you know, like children's films, you know, are usually, you know, like, why they're usually, you know, like, very simple. And and then like you know like you know like and then like this film is loud and obnoxiously annoying. So yeah, you know, like and it takes away all the edge. And then like Tom Hanks, you know, like we don't even know like what he's doing in it. So yeah, I yield my time. Ryan, we'll go over to you Is on the clock when ready. As I stated earlier on, looking at the Coen brothers and their filmography, some of the films that, that they have there, some of them can be redeemed through maybe a, uh, like, the pain on certain performances in that film and despite the late cares with the great performances from Irma P. Hall and with Tom Hanks trying his best to do comedy there it is still something that fails because seeing some of the other comedies that the Coen brothers have done Oh Brother with Art Thou uh, Burn After Reading you do see that they are good they, they can take the ridiculous they can take a ridiculous premise and make a good comedy out of it the late killers is just something that failed and is and it doesn't seem clear to me that they were going to redo anyway. And comparing to, as I stated before, with Disney live action films, they have constantly been getting panned after every new release to where 
the nostalgia itself is st- people are starting to really come thin with the with the nostalgia. Despite with the Coens, they know what goes wrong and they're able to easily adjust. Uh, I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to stop here. All right, and that is time. All right, we're going to go ahead and bring the judges in. Um, we're going to put the competitors behind the scenes. Uh, I apologize. My camera uh, unplugged off to take a second once the next round starts <laughs> to put it back in and get it back on. Uh, so I am off screen for the- <laughs> I had like a, a really tough two minutes there. Uh, well, Chris, you just gave us your answer. So why did you uh, vote for Ross since you're up first? <laughs> it's funny. It, like I was hearing what Brian was saying, but at the same time, a lot of his counter argument almost helped Ross case in a way. But, oh, Disney remake is already banned. Then why is it better than Lady Killer? But really, for uh, any excuse of why is Pinocchio better than Lady Killer? Ross brought up, you know, the joke. The summoner scene, they changed. And I just heard from why it's a current but it's a bad current but movie. I never heard once a lot of what made it bad. I heard him bring up, you know, the lead action for good and the other thing. Well, I brought up everything that was bad about Pinocchio. And why did that help him a little bit to the end? So why Ross got me wrong? Okay. Uh Don, over to you, sir. Yeah, I actually I, I kind of feel the opposite. I feel like he really hit on on why Lady Killers was a bad movie and just it, it should have been a much better movie. So I went with Ryan. Oops, sorry. I went with Ryan. No, you're good. Uh yeah. Uh, I, I would say of of the three questions, this has probably been the closest so far um it's tight but i i think i am going to give the edge to ross here only because i think that he the the, the biggest counter argument that I think Ryan had against Pinocchio was the fact that it's a Disney remake and people expect those to be bad. But I I don't think that just puts it away. I do think Ross had more than enough examples to show why Pinocchio is a worse film that the counterpoint didn't 100% work for me. Uh, So with that said, it is going to go to Ross. Uh, With that said though, guys, thanks so much. I'm gonna go ahead and put you guys in the back and we will go ahead and jump into question number four here. Uh, And question number four is a hell of an interesting one. These questions are always interesting because you ask them and you never quite know which way the answers are going to go. Uh, But off the heels of what I'm presuming was the success of a film like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, which was much more relevant when we were recording this and uh, when I wrote these questions. uh, The, uh, no, actually, uh, well, Never mind. I was going to say something, but technically the movie is not fully out when we're recording this uh, or people that have not had a chance to see it. So I'm not going to say anything. But the question is, what role in film history would be better if Zoe Saldana had played the role instead of the original actress? Of course, Zoe Saldana, one of the stars of Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, Now, as always, I like to preface with these questions. This is a hypothetical. This is also not limited to anything specifically. So the competitors can argue uh, based on the actual timeline. You know, she was this old when this movie happened, so she would fit the role. They can argue just off general hypothetical, putting her into any role in film history. Uh, But they have each picked two very different choices and two very different approaches just off the answers alone. So I'm curious to see where this goes. But again, the question is, what role in film history would be better if Zoe Saldana played the role instead of the original actress? Uh, With that said, Ryan, you are back up first, so I'll give you the timer, and it'll start when you begin speaking. Okay. Damn. Okay. Well, I'm going to go off straight off the hand. I'm just going to fly out, mainly tying into Zoe Saldana, her being connected a lot with... uh, comic book movies nowadays i decided to pick a comic book movie though i thought she really could have done a good job replacing the actress for and that movie is batman and robin and the actress who she could have replaced it and to those who have just heard me say batman and robin then you automatically know who i'm going to say she could have replaced and that is alicia silverstone who played barbara wilson aka batgirl in that film 
I do have more points to bring up there, but I will say that Zoe Zeldana, she was around at least nearly 20 or 21 around time of filming for Batman, Batman and Robin. So she was definitely well within that age range to play a very young Batgirl. And also she has experience as a dancer. And so she would have been very well doing a lot of choreographed fights, but you know, and also early in her career, she was a very great, she is a very, she was talented early in her career and she would have brought a little more to the role of Barbara than Alicia Silverstone did all in my time. All right, Ross, over to you for your opening minute. Okay. I'm going to pick a film that not that many people know about. It's Scorsese's, um, you know, uh, uh, Age of Innocence. And then, like, she would play the one known a writer part. It's because, like, you know, like, I could see her playing, you know, like like this, like like this, almost like the, like, like, like a sweet, like, debutante type of role, you know, you know, like, and then, like, she's only, she's a little bit young, young for it then. She would have been, like, 15. But still, like I can see her in that type of, type of role, you know, you know, you like it because you know, you know, you know, you know, like she's done like period pieces before, so yeah, you know, like I could really see it too, yeah. So, so yeah, you have my time. All right, so go ahead and turn it back over. So once again, just to give the judges the answer, since I don't have the graphics, uh, uh, Ryan's answer is Zoe Saldana as Batgirl and Batman. Man and Robin in place of Alicia Silverstone. Ross's answer is Saldana in The Age of Innocence in place of Winona Ryder. Uh, with that said, Ryan, we're going to go back over to you. Two minutes on the clock when ready. One, uh, one of the uh, one out of maybe of the few main reasons why I picked Zoe to replace Alicia Silverstone is mainly because the character Barbara Wilson, even though out of the fact that she's Batgirl, she, she's she has no tie into the character of Barbara Gordon in the comic books. So the fact that Barbara Wilson is meant to be some original character could have worked very well to the advantage of Zoe Saltana. The fact that her character is meant to be the niece of Alfred Pennyworth. What better way to be than having her come in and she being the brother to her, her she, she's being the brother to Alfred Pennyworth, who in the film is being is serving as a butler to a Maharaja in India. So that can throw in some ethnicity to her character being so that can easily not only easily explain her being there uh, to the Wayne Manor, but also the fact that she is a she is a, she is an ethnic descent. She studied time in London. So then it fills on into where she gets kicked out for, uh, you know, illegal racing, her being a computer genius. Sure, she sure Barbara Wilson wasn't given that much in the film alone, but having Zoe Saldana there fills in the back. It fills in all that time. I mean, it logically pieced together the whole backstory for her character. And then from there on, we can have Zoe Zaldana go in, maybe have some more opportunities to interact with Chris O'Donnell to balance out between the different personalities between her and Dick Grayson. See her actually do some acrobatic stunts as Batgirl. I mean, sure. Uh, Zoe, I mean, sure, Uma Thurman may not provide much in their fight, but we could have seen a lot more from Zoe Zaldana in a Batgirl outfit. And also, I think she, even as young, her one of her earlier debuts was in 2002 at Crossroads. She already had herself a charisma coming off from her to where she can easily carry herself alongside Chris O'Donnell whenever they have their back and forth with each other. I'm running short on my time, so I'm going to concede. Okay. All right. So that'll be Ryan's two minutes. Ross, your two minutes is up next, so we'll go ahead and go back over to you. The timer will start once you begin speaking. Okay, she would actually like. Um, she's proven that like she's actually a very good actress. Actress too, too, and there, and then like you know, you know, like you said that like she has the physicality, uh, and then you know, like how they would basically have to create a character for her. This one is that uh, is that like you know, not, like in the movie, Winona Ryder's character is from a different class, so like they could like bring in the whole like race thing to it you know you know like while not changing that much of the character so yeah you know like she is actually like you know you know like imagine her her acting with daniel day lewis and michelle pfeiffer yeah so i yield my time all right we'll go ahead and jump into the four minute open discussion the timer will start back up for you guys when the first competitor speaks 
I think honestly, I would need more to sell me on the idea of Zoe. Like, I mean, sure, yes, you've already sold me on the fact of her class, of her, of the character of maybe being of a different class there, and and the fact that this film is set in the Americas, it makes it does make some sense. But um, just her, I mean, sure. I, I didn't sure her going to with, cross with Daniel Day Lewis and with Michelle Pfeiffer is a good point, good thing there. But uh, what else would Zoe Zaldana add that would make her replacement with no writer any like an improvement or any different? It's because like you know, like when Ona Ryder actually plays it kind of annoyingly, and then like I've never heard of Zoe Saldana being annoying at all, you know. So yeah, I mean. I mean, if that's the whole case, there, then I, I, I honestly don't see it as enough because that her being back, her her and my vision of being back, girl, she not only would be annoying, but she'd also be someone who's kind of uh, annoyingly persistent. And I would say uh, because with her performances in the movie, Bat Girl, she's doing illegal races in order to raise money for you know to get Alfred away from the life. Having Zoe's in there possibly could have introduced some elements, and not because of her of her ethnic ethnic dis ethnic ethnic oh, I can't even say it right now, but her of her ethnic background, but because of the fact that she is of a different race and of a different class to Alfred, she could have poss- she could probably give more of a endearing moment with, that I did not see from Alicia and Michael Goff whenever they inter- interacted with each other to bring more dimension, honestly. Because uh, Zoe has shown in films that she's in, in not only in the Guardians films, but films that she's done outside of her own, like Columbiana. And I said in the film Crossroads that she is embarrassingly co starred with Britney Spears. She's able to play a bit of an annoyance, but also be very endearing in her characters. What I meant was she wouldn't be annoying. You know, oh, like, and I, and I said, yeah. you know, like, I said, Winona Ryder was annoying in it. So, yeah, yeah, you know, and I like, imagine, you know, like, like, you know, like her charisma with Daniel Day Lewis would be better, you know, like, because, like, that's one of the main problems with the movie that her and Daniel Day Lewis have no chemistry. And then, like, I've seen Zoe Saldana have chemistry with anybody, literally. That is true. She would have chemistry, with saying, which is why I think she also would improve the chemistry between herself interacting with Chris O'Donnell and with Michael Goff, who plays Bat, who, who plays Alfred. Um, but one thing I do see an issue with, I did say earlier on around that time when Batman and Robin was coming out, she was nearly about to be in her 20s. And you did say Age of Innocence was coming out like 94, early 90s. She kind of would have been made, and if we're, but if we have to factor in the production, which honestly she could have been maybe early, like 12 or 13 during that time of shooting. And while, um, so it does, it, I, I, it's been a while since I've seen the film. So I don't know how her being of that young age uh, interacting with Daniel Day Lewis might change the character night dynamics between the two care between the two in that film. Well, yeah, her, but you know, like uh, they actually like aged her up from the book too, so they would have probably would have you know, yeah. So you know, so they probably would have done it, yeah, you know. But yeah, you know, she's actually like very, you know, like I think that like she'll do, you know, like she's better, you know, like and then you know, like. Like, you know, like she's, you know, you know, you know, like, and then like plus, plus like, you know, like the character is starts off, ends up pretty kind. And then like, I can see her as kind. So, so yeah. Okay. With the character growth. Um, one, I mean, one other thing I do want to add with her and Batman and Robin, not just for the comic book accuracy, but because she herself as a, a play, portraying a very young teenager, she also could provide a lot of great energy, especially if we were able to exp- expand more time for her being in- Oh, shit. I was not trying to get that note out there. <laughs> All right. Well, the good news is, Ryan, you do close first, so you'll get the chance to continue. You have one minute on the clock when ready. Okay. Do we have extensions? No. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, that's the old format. Okay. Okay. I have been doing a lot of stressing on how Zoe Saldana would be an improvement. One thing I did mention that if Zoe Saldana was added more into Batman and Robin, there could have been more, there could be also more opportunities to work with her because in Batman and Robin, the deleted behind the scenes footage, they did want to do more with Batgirl's character, especially wanted to show more of her interacting with street gangs when it came with 
the inter- when it came with doing these illegal street races, having the young Zoe Zeldana hold her own out there, actually have some devoted screen time that's separate from Batman and Robin really could have really definitely gave her would have given her more of a flesh fleshed out her character more instead of having her to sit by a computer and crack a code. Although thinking about it now, she actually would have had more better quips and responses every time she kept failing on trying to figure out Alfred's password. But beyond then, her being her of her character of her of her, of her ethnic background fills in the backstory of that Alfred explains to Bruce and Dick. Her being a nearly not at the same age as Crystal Dawn, but somewhere around that energy to where he, she can do a great back and forth. And, with her. and fuck, I wish we had extensions. <laughs> yeah. All right, Ross, over to you. Final minute. Okay, you're just talking about you know a lot like her ethnic background. Like in the film, though, you know, like it's about you know, like wanting to break free from from the societal norms. So then, like you know, like she could be the perfect foil for Daniel Day Lewis to break him to, to cause him to break free. So yeah, you know, like you know, like and then and then I uh, like you know you know you know like Scorsese directing her would 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 make a good movie even better. Your film is just bad bad because of the bad writing. And they're like you know like not one aspect will save the film. My film is already a good movie. It could make it, you know, one of the greats. So yeah, I yield my time. All right, that is time there. I'm gonna go ahead and put you guys in the back, and I will bring the judges in here. Uh, so I did run one quick fact check during the round, just because it was something that prominently did come up, which was uh, because they were both speaking in sort of real time about her acting career, Zoe Saldana's age, given when the films were made. Uh, so during uh, the production of Batman and Robin, which would have taken place majorly in 1996, uh, Zoe Saldana would have been 18 years old for the majority of that production. She would have been 14 in 1992 when Age of Innocence was made. Uh, for the comparison's sake, Winona Ryder would have been 21 when Age of Innocence was being made. So there's a seven-year age difference between Ryder and Saldana. Uh, but with that said, Don, we're going to go to you. Who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? Yeah, um, I got. I got to be honest. I just don't. I just didn't get enough about why she would be good for Age of Innocence over Batgirl. I just like Ryan gave us a lot of different points on why uh, she would have fit that movie better, and I just didn't get enough out of. Ross for why she would have fit uh, Age of Innocence. So I went with Ryan. Absolutely. Chris, down to you, same question. Yeah, and much I'd like to forget about that film, um, and I pray that would never happen in that ultimate reality. I got my vote. Yeah. She, every day she he went to about what how she would fit in Batman Robin, that movie. Perfectly <laughs> that's about it. The bat story, the background, everything. Yeah, why you paint a pretty good picture about film people should forget. <laughs> yeah. A lot of great points. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so, competitors, thank you guys so much. Or judges, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and put you guys in the back because we are currently drawn at a two to two score, which means we are going to go just a little longer into the blind round. Here's how that works if you need a reminder. Uh, this is a question that has no correlation to anything previously from this match. The competitors also have no uh, concept of where this question is going to go. Uh, I will first ask them a generalized prompt. My example has always been name me a Will Smith film. Off of that generalized prompt, they will answer the question, and then they will be given the actual question that they will debate. Whether or not they feel their answer 100% matches, they will have to attempt to debate it. Uh, and other than that, the round itself stays the same. They will get a few minutes off screen to prepare as well for this, should they need it. <clears throat> uh, so with that said, competitors, are you guys ready for your prompt? Yes. Let's do this. <laughs> okay. Your prompt is, name me a Ryan Johnson film. That's it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, that is it. Name hey, me a Ryan Johnson whoa, whoa, whoa. Looper. Knives Out. Okay. Ross submits Looper. Ryan, you said Knives Out? Yes. I'm going to close my door. Okay. So the battle is Looper versus 
Knives, Knives Out. Guys, there's a real trick behind this. The question is, what is Ryan Johnson's best film? Uh, with the answers being Looper versus Knives Out. Now, with that said, editors are going to have a couple of minutes behind the scenes to put an argument together. For you at home, it'll be just a matter of seconds back with the blunder. are back and jumping into the blind round here with our competitors. So if you at home needed a reminder, the blind round prompt was to name a Ryan Johnson film. The question itself is, what is Ryan Johnson's best film? Uh, the answers are Looper coming in from Ross, Knives Out coming in from Ryan. Ross, because you did answer first, you are going to be going first. Uh, anyways, guys, when we reach this point in the match, I always like to give the competitors a congratulations anyways because you've been evenly matched enough to reach this point, but unfortunately, only one can win. So once again, best of luck. I'll go ahead and pull up that timer, and Ross, when you are ready, it, it will begin. Okay. My pick is Looper is because, like, you know, like, it's got the tightest screenplay, and then, like, you know, like, it combines elements really well. But, like, it's a horror sci-fi and then, like, you know, you know, not like, um, and then the cast is just amazing. You know, like, they actually have a cast that, that I think that like people don't talk about. You know, you know, like, you got like, um, Joseph Gordon Levitt, Bruce Willis, Emily Bunt, Piper Pelabo, Tall, um, uh, Jeff Daniels, um, uh, uh, Paul Dano. So, yeah, 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 you know, you know, like, and then, like, I think it might be Joseph Gordon Levitt's best, perfor best, best performance. Along with um, along 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 with the, like, it is complicated, but it also isn't. So yeah, I yield my time. All right, so that is the one minute opening for Looper. Ryan, we'll go back over to you for Knives Out. Your one minute opening will begin once the timer turns back over to zero. My argument for Knives Out being Ryan Johnson's best film, mainly because the film plays it is exactly the story. It's a story that Ryan Johnson not only wants to tell, but it's something that he's able to do so. He's not bogged down. He's not limited to what, uh, uh, like what, what, what to, he's not limited by anything that's holding him back. He's able to tell a very straightforward, a very well, not straightforward, but a very simple story that is simply a, mi a murder mystery that starts off very simple. But going, but going further on, it's pretty much talking about like every murder mystery. You have the murder, and then you have that deep, complex, entangled web to where you try. It falls onto a who done it. But Ryan Johnson's able to do it to where it's more than just a who done it, and it tells the kind of stories that he wants to keep moving forward, and it shows how the growth that he has made as a director, and the fact that not only he has been able to bounce back from what many people had said was a divisive film, The Last Jedi, but show that in, in, in his hands, when he is not, as I said, not bogged down anymore, he's able to really tell a story the way he wants to tell and it, time. and people in the audience server will follow. Fuck. All right. Good there. Ross, back over to you. You have two minutes on the clock when ready. Okay. Yours is actually like, you know, like, oh, okay. What's the main point of a mystery? Is you don't know who does it. What the problem with Knives Out is that like it's pretty easy to figure out what the mystery is. And then like you know, like my film's a mystery too, but in a different way. And then like you know, like it's always keeping you guessing. So then like you know, like so then like you don't know, but but then like you know, like and then like you know, uh your film is good, you know, like but then like your film is almost overstuffed. My film, you know, like has a great cast members, but like each one does their part so yeah i yield my time all right well go ahead ryan and you'll go get your two minutes the timer starts back once it rolls over to zero for you talking about oh we're oh no no Hold on, stop, stop. I... 
Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. I can hear you. My screen paused and then went black for three for for a minute. So I just wanted to make sure you can hear me. Yeah. You're you're lagging, but yeah. You're good on my end. Okay, I'm just going to my phone. I I can't do this. Say that the film is overstuffed. That's kind of an oversimplification. The reason why there are so many cast members and actors in this film is because the point of it, of Ryan John. It's the point of this whole murder mystery. Sure, it is a whodunit, but yes, he does. No spoilers for anyone watching. He does do a lot of subversions along the way, but it doesn't subtract. It doesn't distract away from the whole point of this film. Is that it's all about this deep entangled web that is surrounding the death of a family patriarch and the dis and the dysfunction of the family itself because once you put because Ryan Johnson doesn't just push the murder away in order to highlight the dysfunction of his family they're deeply tied in together and then it starts to play out more to what Ryan Johnson's telling with this film he's doing lots of social commentary on classism along uh, a, a, a commentary about families and going further along in you start to see exactly damage that generations can cause from the from the next and moving on forward the fact that it's very simple and self-contained story is one of the reasons why it's so good now with looper yes he has himself a good cast there but at the same time it's also to its detriment because he has to spread itself apart going from different locations having to focus on different pairs of groups with Looper, he's keeping everything self-contained. So once we do move away from the big ensemble of the cast, not only is it a breath of fresh air for the audience, but it definitely makes the audience feel more going towards the, 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 the protagonist of the film, which which you can either say is Daniel Craig or Anna de Armas, either one of those two. So going with the overstuffed thing is a little too much, but even then, Ryan Johnson uses a simple murder mystery to really tell a fun Fast-paced editing, which feels very seamless when you start doing the when you start looking at the Thromby family and how quick Johnson is able to go back and forth from interviewing to the family to to uh, to to oh my god I'm gonna lose my mind here so I'm gonna stop to cease my time. All right, uh, we're gonna go into the four-minute open discussion. The timer starts back up when the first competitor speaks. One thing I did mention earlier on is that this film, not only is Ryan Johnson not yeah, bogged sure, down, but it plays to yeah. his strengths. It plays to his strengths yeah, as a director. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have 20, 20 something. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, no. I was talking to my friend. Sorry. Oh, no. Yeah. I'm like, that's why I was holding here. I didn't, I didn't want to start. Right, go, uh, but go ahead. Okay, yeah, but you know, sorry, I missed your completely your argument. Sorry, my I friend. was saying that Dives Out plays to his strengths that that makes him very good as a director. He's able to work very well with his multicast. Yeah, but okay, like mine though too. Like my my film though, like actually, um, actually, like is actually like it, after like you know, like he had the build is 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 great world building, and then and then like you know you know like my film too. You know, like, you know, like has maybe like just Corn Levitt's best performance you know you know that like you've ever given and then like two like and then I'd like argue. you know like and then and then like you know um and then it has like bruce willis's last great performance so and if you're gonna talk about performances knives out brings out a great performance from christopher Plummer. brings out an amazing performance from jamie lee curtis from michael shannon Chris Evans, who many people could for constantly kept attaching to Captain America, this role got many people to shake that little shake that feeling off. And Armis is fantastic in this role. Daniel Craig is fantastic in this role, who many people could not help but keep comparing him to Bond. Now, I mean, and even the minor characters in the background he has with uh, with the chill with the grandchildren with the help even with uh Lakeith Stanfield's character they are all very important in adding to this background and this portrait that uh Ryan Johnson is painting every character has their importance and they have their use in Looper you if you just remove if uh, Jeff Daniels despite being a mob boss I don't see what other use he has in that film other than telling the character where to go to when he's made that final kill he's kind of useless afterwards 
you have like but like without it the story wouldn't exist without him it's because you remember like he's a hitman and then and then you know you know like so so i so not like without him you know like there would be no story so you can't really have jeff daniels without it without the, you know without the movie well technically you could because bruce willis's character he comes from a different time point to where joseph's character in the past decides to take his advice otherwise if jeff daniels is not there he immediately just would have gone to the, the country he wanted to. And while, yes, it is kind of the point of the change in narrative, but also you do see that with Joseph Gordon's character, he's not, you, I mean, you say it's his best performance, but I think his better performance is, is in 500 Days of Summer to where he's actually shining more. In this film, he's just trying to play more of a younger Bruce Willis, but still match with his own energy here. And one thing I can say with, Knives Out is that every character has a very strong personality. And yeah, but like, but and you're with a dysfunctional like, family. Yeah, but like you were bringing up about like you know like how great Jamie Lee Curtis is and how great Christian Plummer is. They're great in everything. This has Bruce Willis's best performance, who's good. But 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 like I would never consider him great. Oh, in, in this and then like you know like he had his own personal stuff. But still, you know you know like in Bruce Willis, you could tell like actually cared and that was thanks to ryan johnson's amazing screenplay amazing direction i we what we'd all want to go and fall with that but that just can't be something that's on hindsight it should be something you should be re-watching in this film and with bruce willis yes he does a good performance in that but then afterwards but that's not but his performance there is the same energy i would see he puts in like 16 blocks or he would put in a glass honestly it's a good performance when he's matched with Joseph Gordon-Levitt, but once he's by himself, not much is there. But with Christopher Plummer, not only the way he's back and forth with every family member, but when he's in those small moments with Anne Armas, you see his character and his personality shine more, which plays not only to the strength on how Ryan Johnson is able to utilize every actor in his cast and not just keep them in the background. They play every per everybody is an important piece. And time. All right, we're gonna go into the final minute of the round. Ross, you are up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. Okay, you're you know you know like every single character in my movie you know you know like you know like have a point you know and you're like and then like you you know you know like your film all the characters are just red herrings you know like so like yeah so you think that like everyone could do it you know but then like you know like my film you know you know you know like Paul Dano is important you know like even though that you say uh he's not he is you know like and then and then like you know you know like piper parable is important emily blunt is important too so yeah like like every single character you know like mine if you were to take out you know like like, like in your film like if you were to take out that nazi kid the film wouldn't be any different you know like so literally you know yeah so i yield my time okay all right, we'll go ahead and bump the clock forward. Ryan, you have the final minute of the round. The timer starts back up for you once you begin speaking. First off, the kid is not very indifferent. No, the, the family still would have found out later on they were going to get removed from the will. It just leads to that great moment where Chris Evans tells the family to eat shit. But beyond that, no, the family in my film, I, I constantly kept saying everyone is being utilized for importance. Not because it's a whodunit in the red herrings, but I did say it is about, it is a commentary on generations and on the damage is done on classism. And every member of that family all has their own separate opinion, their own separate of culture clash that, that makes them all very important. It's why in the opening of that film, when they're doing those flashbacks, everyone has their own different perspective on what happened that night. It's not to be about the red herring. It's about, it's for Ryan Johnson as their director to get us to understand these characters. So the moment he does the subversion trope on the whodunit, it's no longer about that mystery. It is about these people and the message that he is trying to push in this film. And I will close there. All right, guys. Once again, an excellent match from both of you, but I'm, I'm going to sit you guys in the back and we are going to turn this over to the judges as I bring them in here. Uh, Chris, I'm going to go to you first on this one. Who gets your vote and what was the main selling point? So it's just tough. Um, two fit hat depends on my two favorite Ryan Johnson movie, but um, yeah, it's really enough. And it's the one that convinced me the most. It's mine. That's all. 
He brought out everything, you know, about the mystery itself from the performance of the cast to what Ryan Johnson done bad. And he just built a better argument saying, you know, we got amazing performance, Chris Evans, for everybody, and the murder mystery is so good. Only kind of argument I've heard from Mark is that, like, it's predictable. He, like, and that, you know, it's been done before. And Ryan brought up, you know, everything with Looper that, you know, Bruce Roller good, but he's been good at other things that, you know, it seemed better performance. So I got my point in the end. Hmm. All right, Don, down to you. Yeah, um, I just feel like overall Ryan had a had a much stronger um, uh, case overall, as far as like he said with the social commentary and the way they feel like a dysfunctional family and and everything that Ryan Johnson brought to to directing that movie. So again, I went with Ryan. All right, well, judges, thank you guys so much. Uh, normally this transition's a bit smoother, but we're recording another match after this, so I'm going to rush this bitch. With that said, your winner by a final score of 3-2 to two is the Caramel Mountain, Ryan Payne, taking the victory. Uh, Ryan, congratulations. Oh, that's got the timer in the top. Congratulations, sir. Right. Uh, two and two now. Uh, obviously, now you got some blind round experience. I'm not 100% certain, not just off memory, if you've had that in your previous matches yet. Um, in, but you in, have that in experience. The, in the old format, I had. Like, the, the new format's different. You know. Sure. So, yeah. So, first time in the blind round specifically there, uh, going to that sudden death. Uh, how are you feeling after that matchup? I'll admit, um, one thing I wanted to keep to myself was not to ramble and prone on. and But, but you know, it's like I keep falling back on my wheels and I was definitely not putting anything under Ross. When he was on point about what he had, he was definitely focused and on point. I was he did, it did throw me off in the first two rounds. He was always spending his time there, but then seeing how he's able to keep it focused and maintain started making me realize that yeah, I just needed to do a quick turn because after the uh, I thought I had it with the lady killers, but <laughs> no, when he won that, I'm like, okay doubling down with Batman and Robin. I got to paint a beautiful portrait here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So obviously now you're two and two kind of going into the middle stretch of this season, the summer months here, uh, obviously going into the fall, then we have the year end tournament, mm -hmm. you know, at the minimum, you'll get one more match before that potentially two, if it works with schedules and some wins would put you in a good position to get into that tournament at that 50, 50 record. Is that something you look to, or are you just kind of taking this one at a time? I'm honestly taking this one at a time. I know from re-watching my matches, I am, or at least from even playing, I am not a good, well, I'm not saying I'm great at arguing, but it's clear that I'm still stuck in my way. Even when I keep myself struck down to three or four pinpoint notes, I do tend to ramble on. I feel like maybe I should just start going back to the old ways where I'm writing out my explanation and then self-editing it while I'm talk, while I'm you know going over my arguments. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Well, you did a great job tonight. You showed that when the going got tough, you can still get in there and pull it out. Congratulations to you on the win, sir. Until next time, we will see you as I go ahead. I That's myself I pulled out, not you. <laughs> I'll go ahead and put you in the back, and I will bring Ross on screen here. And uh, Ross, despite the fact that it was uh, unfortunately a second loss for you, I definitely think as a player there was growth here. I think you put in a better performance. Obviously, you pushed yourself into the blind round on only your second go around. So there's a lot to be positive out of this, despite it being a loss. How are you feeling? I feel great about it. You know, like I this was a really fun match to do. You know, like so yeah, yeah. I've been doing you know like how many months we pushed this back. It feels like. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, at the minimum, this is the group itself. We didn't delay it over a month, but the group itself has been set up for at least a month, yeah, which is a lot longer than the average battleground match for anyone. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. But, you know, like, I feel like, you know, like, I can get better, you know, so, yeah, so I'm going to take some yeah, time. Yeah, of course. You know, yep, yep. So, yeah, yeah, so I do want to ask you. Ryan, uh, Ryan was, a great, was a great opponent, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I did want to ask you because uh, – you have a tactic and you used it in your first match. You did it here tonight as well, where it seems like you have a point in your head that you want to make. And once you make it, if you don't feel like there's anything else you can add in that moment, you'll just concede the time, uh, you know, at some point conceding more than a minute of speaking time, which is a tactic that a lot of sort of to use quote air quotes, because they are the best ranked players in the league, not always necessarily the best, but like the top players would sort of look at that and go, why would you ever do that? But it, 
points tonight, I think it did certainly work for you. I think you could see that it did throw Ryan off a little bit as a competitor. And I think to some extent being short and sweet sometimes is the way to go about it. Do you think that it benefited you in the long run or do you uh, think maybe you could find more to fill in? I, I think it benefits me is because, you know, you know like I, I, don't know, I don't like to ramble. So, yeah. So if I make my point, then I made my point, you know, and there's no need rambling, you know. Fair enough. There's obviously different approaches work for different people. Uh, and again, despite the fact that currently you are 0 and 2, I think there is. Uh, is this the most losses to start the career? Or no. Oh, no, no, no. It can get so much worse. Trust me. It can get so. We, we've got players that are on like five game loss streaks. It can get so much worse. Okay. I don't think it'll get that bad for you. I think you've shown some good promise in these first couple of matches. So, till the next time, take care of yourself, sir. We will see you then. Yeah, uh, as I go you. ahead and put you in the back. And guys, again, I think this is a match where both players can take positives from it. I think Ryan pulls out another win. He's 50-50 now. I think uh, certainly the fact that he can sit here even in a win and point out a flaw in his debate or more specifically in his debate style shows that he is thinking about this in a way to help him improve. And I think that Ross really put it out on the table tonight and showed that he has improved since his first match and will only continue to get better since then. Uh, so with that said, I do want to thank our judges, uh, Don and Chris, for being here with us tonight. I do want to thank the competitors once again, Ross and Ryan. Thank you to all of you guys for watching. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel, rate the video, and stick around for more content because we have lots of movie battleground coming in the future. With all that said, though, my name is Aaron Canole, and until next time, take care, everybody.